Uh huh. Okay, we are recording. Uh, and let me switch. Let me go ahead and, and share screens here. Uh, there were a few a few changes that I made. Um, some minor changes on Web Campus that I think will uh, that I, I I think will help out. Uh, but I wanted to go over that. Um, so um, the first thing that I and, I and I believe I did mention this as well. Uh, and the announcement, the uh, email I sent out. Um, but I added a new uh, module on Web Campus here. Uh, I, I did create the uh, uh, document on, on using fractions in the uh, TI30X2S. Um, uh, and, uh, I tried to put that together. Uh, I might've went a little bit too fast on that. So if you need more information, let me know, but I did, uh, try to try to put as much information there as, as was possible. Uh, and I also decided that I would group the, um, the digital lecture pages together, uh, since it's just going to be a lot easier to find them here, uh, especially since um, in the in the original uh, schedule we were going to be doing about a chapter a week, and in that case it would make sense to put the uh, to put the the pages with the lecture notes uh, on the actual. Uh, modules uh, associated with that with that chapter, but um, since we fell a little bit behind in, in the schedule, which is fine, we can uh, we adjust for that. Uh, then I thought it would be easier to just have that here. Um, so those were a couple of, of things that I that I changed. Uh, let's see. It was uh, we are going to be going through the project. Uh, today. If we have time after the lecture, which we should, we don't have a lot of material to lecture with. Uh, so this is what we will be um, going through, or I guess the, the information here. So, um, well, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this right now. I want to kind of jump into the lecture if possible, but, uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, Thank you for, for that question. The, the, the due date for this uh, is pushed back as well. Uh, the, due date, the, the due date for the uh, theme group projects will be due the weekend of the exam. So since the exam is pushed to next week, then the due date for this is pushed to that next week as well. Um, will be uh, due on that Sunday with the rest of the, of the homework if we have homework that week. Um, so let me, let's go to the digital paper. We'll, we'll come back to the, to the project. Let's go to, to the digital paper here. And, uh, let me ask if there are any questions or comments from any of the, uh, previous material or homework. And you can either, um, use the audio if you are comfortable enough or, uh, type in chat. Uh, can I ask uh, uh, briefly, uh, sometimes during the homework, I get confused on the conversions, whether to use um, the uh, kilometers per for the mile or the miles for the kilo per kilometer oh, measurement. Oh, um, from the, from the table? All right. Um, so that's that's actually that's um, I think I mentioned a little bit on that, but I I don't remember if I did. So let's, did let's, go, I... let's go through that. Oh oh, uh, the question, a couple of questions in the chat before I before I jump into that. That that is a good question. Um, 
Oh yes, uh, project two, question two, there was a typo on, on the solutions. Uh, so I'll be giving back points for that since that was uh, my mistake and not your mistake. As long as you have the correct answer on that, uh, you'll get the correct, correct point back. And the uh, scratch work upload for tomorrow, uh, that's supposed to be for the, I think that's supposed to be for the exam. So I think that just has the wrong date. Uh, so I'm gonna, um, fix that. Uh, but let's let's look at the table. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is your question. Um, on table uh, 2.4, uh, when you're when you're converting, let's say between kilometers and miles, uh, we have two um, conversion factors when one is one mile equals 1.6093 kilometers and the other one is one kilometer equals 0 0.6214 miles and if if i if i heard the question right and i i might i might not have um, but if i heard it heard it right the, the question is which one of these do we use is that is that correct Yes, uh, it's um, a little, okay. sometimes it's a little confusing to know which, which version to use in a problem. Fair, okay. Um, I, uh, as it turns out, you can use either one of these. So personally, I always just use this one, just whichever one comes first. Uh, but you could use this one if you want, you will get the same, same solution. And the reason for that is if we, let me see, how, how do I want to, how do I want to frame this? So um, with this one we have as a conversion factor, there's one mile per 1.6093 kilometers. And so if we wanted to actually uh, switch that where we have uh, kilometers, on top and uh, miles on the bottom, what we would do is we would, if we want this to be one, then this would be one over the 1.6093. Um, this part, sorry, this, this is uh, uh, probably a little more complicated than I wanna get for this material, but this uh, is actually going to be the 0 0.6214. Uh, let's just verify that with our calculator. So if we do the uh, one divided by 1.6093, we should get the other one, 0 0.6214, yes. Um, and so they are the, they are the same, uh, so ignoring everything else, ignoring the, because this, again, this, this is a little bit, a little bit complicated. Uh, it goes into fraction theory, which I don't know if I want to really touch on, um, but, uh, these these two numbers are equivalent, or these two conversion factors are equivalent. One is the reciprocal of the other. Um, so the book says if you want to convert, uh, the book says use this when you're going from the U.S. system to the metric system, and then says use this when you when you're going from the metric system to the U.S. system. Uh, but really, you can use either one of them in either case as long as you have uh, have the conversion factor set up to where the correct one will cancel. Um, so if you, as long as you have, uh, take for example, if you're converting um, kilometers to miles, oops, if you have uh, 20 kilometers and you want to convert that into miles, or let's say 20 miles and you want to convert that into kilometers, then as long as you uh, have miles on the bottom, and kilometers on the top, you can use either of the conversion factors. So if you multiply this by 1.6093, then that will give you the same solution uh, as if you were to use the other conversion factor. So this will give you the same solution if you use the uh, 20 miles uh, times if we use the um, other conversion factor, which is one kilometer and 0 
and I didn't give myself enough room there. Uh, one kilometer and the 0 0.6214 miles. So again, as long as the miles cancel, you will get the same number and you can, you can test that out. So um, really you can use either conversion factor you want. Um, the, the textbook says uh, that recommends that you use this one for US to metric and this one for metric to US. But really, as long as you keep the, the denominator straight so that the, the correct cancelization occurs, then you can use either one. Um, so hopefully that, that answers that question. Um, if, if you need more clarity, let me know. Uh, um, are there any other questions? Okay. And again, I'm gonna keep my eye on chat because I know that uh, for those of you who don't like to use the audio or, or possibly don't have audio to use, um, a microphone to use, uh, there's a little bit of delay. So I'll keep my eye on chat. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the class got ahead of me on that and, and took attendance. So if you are here, please type here in the chat. And I'll try and remind you guys before, before the uh, end of class. Um, OK, so if there are no other questions, let's go ahead and finish up chapter 3. So uh, the last part of 3A is a little bit uh, different from the, uh, the three usages we have for percentages. Uh, so it's, um, it is related, but it is not in that, in that table. Uh, but I believe there are some, some questions on it. So this is 3A whoop, continued. And the last part of this is solving uh, percentage problems. And so um, these types of problems occur all the time and you're probably already familiar with it even if you uh, haven't done it formally in a, in a mathematical uh, course before, but let's go ahead and, and type it out. So if you have some final value is P percent, so we could have any percent here, it could be 25%, 5%, uh, more than an initial value, then we use the equation, uh, we'll generally use the equation because one of these will be an unknown. We'll use the equation that the final value, and I'm going to use uh, parentheses to indicate that this is a number is equal to, here we have 100 plus P percent times the initial, uh, times the initial value. And here we, uh, we do have to be a little bit careful because uh, remember whenever we're using uh, percent in a formula, this has to be in decimal form. And uh, a different form of this equation, depending on um, what, the, what the problem looks like, we could also state that the initial value is the final value divided by this 100 plus P percent. And again, uh, that's going to be in decimal form. So just as a, as a reminder, uh, whenever you are using a percent in an equation, you're going to have to use the decimal form of that percent. Um, so if it's 5%, you'd convert it to 0.05. If it's 27%, convert it to 0.27. Um, so an example of this uh, is, take for example, sales tax. So if we have a, a label on something, let's say a, a, an item of, of clothing or uh, a, a container of cookies, some, and, you know, something that we're buying and there's some sort of sales tax for it, uh, then we're increasing the price by a certain percent, whatever the, the uh, sales tax percent is. And so then solving, uh, take for example, if we know what the pre-tax price is, we know what the final price is by using this equation. Uh, another, the other, um, let's see, here this is more than, if we are using less than, 
if it's less than a value, like take, for example, if you're having a sale on an item, uh, we use 100 minus P. Uh, so for less than, we use 100 minus P percent in the equations. All right. Uh, so if, if we're increasing the price, we just add whatever the percentage increase is. For decreasing the price, it's subtracting whatever the percent decrease is. Uh, let's look at a quick example for this. Um, for solving this. So let's say that tax charged on clothing sales at a certain place is 5%. If the, let's say, pre-tax price of a t-shirt is $15, what, what is the final amount you will pay for the t-shirt? All right. So here's an example of, of this type of problem. We are... Uh, looking at increasing, in this case, increasing the price of something, although we could do this with uh, things besides price. Uh, I, I believe shopping is the most common place where you'll see this. Um, so here we're shopping at a, at a place. We have sales tax is 5%, so we're increasing the price by 5%. Uh, we want to know what is the final amount that we pay. Um, now, just as a habit, it's usually a good idea to identify what you're looking for and what you already know when you are uh, setting up these problems. This is your P. Uh, the pre-tax price, this then is the initial value. And the final value is what we are looking for. So when we plug this into the equation, we get the final value is equal to 100 plus the 5, that's percent, times the initial value, which is $15. So again, we convert this into its decimal form. Uh, so 100 plus 5, that's 105. As a decimal is 1.05, and then times the $15. And let's see what we get. So and if you're following along, just go ahead and plug this into your calculator. And what you should get, let's see, is $15.75. So after tax, that's going to be the total amount you will owe for that, uh, for the t-shirt. Uh, any questions on this example? Okay, um, so that is the, the last part of this is sol uh, solving percentage problems. Again, uh, if we could also have framed it, uh, if, if sales tax was 7% and we paid, uh, say, $20, $21.75 for something total, what was the pre-tax price, then uh, what we'd be given is the uh, final value and be searching for the initial value. Um, but the equation here will be the same. Okay. Uh, we're skipping 3B. So the last section that we have is 3C. And this section does not have a lot of material compared with uh, 3A. So I believe we should be able to cover this fairly quickly. So this is dealing with uncertainty is the title of the, of the section. Uh, so here we're, we're looking at a little bit, uh, one, one more application for percentages. And uh, so when we are measuring something like temperature or weight, uh, when we're measuring something, even distance, uh, we can find uh, what is called the absolute error and relative error. Oops. 
So the absolute error in a measurement. So here we're always, we've, we've measured something, could be a distance, could be a weight, could be the temperature. Um, we've measured something, the absolute error in that measurement uh, describes how far a measured or claimed value is from the true value. And so this we can also do with, with estimations. Like I could say, well, uh, if I'm standing here and I'm looking at an object over there, I could say, well, it's about five feet. Um, so that's my claimed value. I can, I can figure out what is the absolute error in that, in that uh, claimed measurement. Um, so here we're looking at how far we are from the true value. So that's our absolute error. And so again, the, we have an equation, absolute error, I'll abbreviate that, is equal to the measured value minus the true value. And this uh, should look relatively familiar. Uh, in the last section, uh, we had um, absolute and uh, relative difference and absolute and relative change. And these, these equations that we're coming up with here are the same, same equations, just in a different form. So just using different terminology. Uh, so I like to think of them as the same equation. So let's look at relative error. And you can probably know what I'm gonna say next. Relative error in a measurement Uh, compares the size of the absolute error to the true value and is a percentage. So again, whenever, or a percent. Whenever we see that word relative, we think percent. So uh, here we're looking at the percent error um, in terms of the true value of, some, of the uh, thing that we are measuring, the distance or the weight or the temperature. And the equation for that relative error is equal to, so we have the measured value minus the true value. That is our absolute error divided by the true value because this is in uh, compared to the size of the true value. So divided by the true value. And this is a percent. So we multiply by 100 to get this into percent form. Okay, so let's look at an example for this. Um, an example or two. Let's say that your true weight is 125 pounds, but a scale says you weigh 130 pounds. Let's find the absolute and relative error here. Okay, so I believe I said this last time, but in case I didn't, let me say it this time. Uh, whenever we're dealing with these equations, in this case, we have absolute error is measured value minus true value. We want to identify what is the measured value? What is the true value? Um, in, in this particular case with these, uh, in this context, when we're looking at error, this is a little bit easier to determine. Uh, when we were comparing two values, it was a little more challenging. Um, but here, what is the, let's start with the measured value. What is the measured value? A hundred and thirty pounds. Yes, exactly right. And the true value then is the 125 pounds. Uh, and so you might you might see the the keyword true weight or or true something or you could say actual weight or actual something. Uh, there will be some sort of signifier there. Uh, but again, this one is a little bit easier to identify. Uh, so let's find again the absolute error and, and relative error. So the absolute error is equal to the measured value is 130 pounds minus the true value is 125 pounds. And so we get a positive five pounds. 
So in this case, again, um, absolute error and relative error, just like absolute difference, relative difference, and, and the other one, absolute change, relative change, can be positive or negative. In this case, because we are comparing the uh, measurement to the true value, if it's positive, the measurement is reading more than what the true value is. So here, the scale is weighing us as five pounds more than what we are. Um, and if it's negative, then, it, it, then the measured value is less than what the true or actual value is. And then let's find the relative error. So the relative error is the measured value, which is 130 pounds, minus the true value is 125 pounds, divided by the true value is 125 pounds, and then times the 100 to get us into percent form. So that would be five pounds divided by the 125 pounds times 100. And here, again, I'm using units to emphasize that these will cancel. And so the five divided by 125 times 100, when we plug that into the calculator, we should get 4%. So the relative error is 4%. And again, that is positive. So the scale is, is weighing us as 4% more than what our actual weight is. All right. Um, so there's one example of this. Let's look at a, at a second example. So let me adjust this since I ran out of room on the other page. So here's another example. Again, uh, we're going to find the absolute and relative error. So let's say that your bike speedometer reads 22 miles per hour, but your actual speed is 24 miles per hour. Let's find the absolute and relative error of this measurement. Okay. So the first thing that we do is identify the true value and the measured value. Let's start with uh, measured value since that is the one that appears first in the equation. So what is the measured value in this example, in this case? Twenty two miles per hour. 22 miles per hour. Oh, that, that's all right. I'm seeing that in chat. That's OK. Uh, and then the true value, so what our actual speed is, in this case, is the 24 miles per hour. And so the um, absolute error, let's start with that. Absolute error is the measured value, which is 22 minus the true value, which is 24. In this case is a negative two miles per hour. So in this case, uh, the absolute error uh, is negative two miles per hour. The measurement is two miles per hour less than what our actual speed is. And let's find the relative error. So the relative error is the measured value minus the true value divided by the true value, and then times 100 to get us into percent form. And when you plug all of this in, you should get a negative 8.3%. And so the, the relative error here is that your, your bike speedometer is 8.3% is measuring the speed 8.3% less than what your actual speed is. OK. So that is uh, absolute and relative error. So again, uh, pretty similar to the concepts uh, we had in the previous section. But here we're applying it to a measurement. And the very last bit of this section is when we are uh, it's generally used when we're comparing two measurements, but it can be applied to any measurement. So. There are, there are two terms that we can use um, to describe, or that will be properties of a, of a measurement. One is accuracy, one is precision. 
So we're going to define what exactly do we mean by accuracy? What exactly do we mean by precision? And then uh, usually when we are comparing two measurements, so if we uh, have two things that are measuring a speed and we know what the actual speed is, then we can compare the two, uh, two measurements. We can ask which one is more accurate, which one is more precise. Uh, so let's go ahead and first we'll define those terms and then we'll look at an example. So accuracy describes how closely a measurement approximates a true value. So an accurate measurement has a small relative error. Or stated another way, the smaller the relative error, the more accurate the measurement. So uh, accuracy, we're describing how close is this measurement uh, to the actual value. The closer we get to the actual value, the more accurate the measurement is. So that's what we mean by accuracy. Precision describes the amount of detail in a measurement. And here, uh, smaller possible units in a measurement mean more detail uh, that is more precision. So let's uh, let's talk about that in just a moment here. Um, Let's see. Um, sorry. Um, so precision. So take, for example, let's say I have a yardstick that has all of the markings marked off. I know that the exact length of this stick is a yard, uh, but it doesn't have any of the markings. I don't know, you know how far a foot is given this, this uh, yardstick. And I measure this, I measure a distance from here to um, take, for example, a, a door, or if we're doing like a, a race from here to the uh, where we want the race to end, uh, then I could measure that distance in yards, possibly even closest to, to a half a yard. I could probably estimate that, uh, but I couldn't get any more detailed than that. Whereas with an actual yardstick that has all of the measurements on there, you can measure it up to probably up to an inch. And so that has more detail. It has more, you can be more precise in measuring that. If it still has the markings, you can measure it up to the closest inch. Uh, which is more detailed, is more precise than measuring it to say the closest uh, half a yard. So those are the those are the two the two differences in those. Um, so let's look at an example for this. Uh, so when we are when we are looking at two At two measurements, oftentimes what we'll ask is which measurement is more accurate, which one is more precise. So let's look at an example for this one. So let's say that your weight, your uh, weight, actual weight is 52.55 kilograms. A scale at the health clinic uh, that gives measurements to the nearest half kilogram so that is uh, 0 0.5 kilogram gives your weight as 52 and a half kilograms. A digital scale at the gym gives readings to the nearest hundredth kilogram. So that is um, Uh, 0 0.01 kilogram gives your weight as 51.48 kilograms. 
And so what we can ask is which measurement is more accurate and which measurement is more precise. Okay. So here uh, we are comparing two measurements. So we have the actual weight in this case, and we have two measurements from two different scales, one at the health clinic, one at the gym. Uh, so let's start with accuracy. Um, which one is more accurate? How can we find which one is more accurate? So let's look back at the definition. Accuracy is how close the measurement approximates the true value. So the closer the measurement is to the true value, the more accurate it is. So another um, way to state that question, instead of saying which, which measurement is more accurate, we could uh, equivalently say which measurement is closest to the true value. And in this case, um, do we know which measurement is closest to the true value? Any thoughts or comments on that? Well, assuming your weight actually is 52.55, the 52.5 would be closer than the 51.48. Right. So that would be more accurate. That's exactly right. But and so 51.48 more precise. Good, yep, so you're jumping out of me with the position, but you're, you're exactly right. Uh, notice here with the scale at the health clinic, this is uh, uh, 0 0.05 kilograms off, whereas this one at the gym is almost a whole kilogram off. Um, one way to check, if we wanted to check this mathematically, if we, uh, if we don't know, uh, if, it, if it's not clear, just looking at it, which one is closer, then we find the uh, we find the relative error. Find the relative error. So with the health clinic, and I'm just going to give you what the relative error is going to be. Uh, it's a good exercise for you guys to check this out uh, on your own to do the equations. Make sure you can get this the uh, uh, this one. But this uh, for the health clinic, the relative error is negative zero point zero nine five percent. And at the gym, the relative error is negative 2.04 percent. So the health clinic is not even uh, is not even a one percent off. It is um, whereas the one at the gym is two percent off, a little more than two percent. Uh, so we say the health clinic is more accurate. And then this was already stated, but which one is more precise? So precision is the detail in the measurement. Which measurement has more detail? Uh, which one gives you the smaller units when you measure the weight? And in this case, that is the gym. Since the gym weighs up to the hun nearest hundredth kilogram, whereas the Health clinic is half a kilogram. The smaller units there are the hundredth kilogram. So the gym is more precise. Now, as a note for this, um, just a, a quick note. Uh, this does not always have to be different measurements. You can have a measurement that is both more accurate and more precise. Um, but in this case, they ended up being different measurements. So uh, just remember that accuracy and precision, those are two separate, two separate things. Accuracy is how close you are to the actual value, to the true value. Uh, whereas uh, precision is how much detail there is in your measurement. What is the smallest unit that you can uh, measure using that scale or that um, if you're measuring temperature, that, that thermometer, and so on. Okay. Uh, so that's the end of that section. So again, that was that was pretty quick. So uh, what we have left is then we're going to uh, look at the group project and separate into groups. Uh, let me let's let's jump to that really quickly um, and let me try and go through this as quickly as possible so that we can get into the groups. Um, uh, 
Uh, yes, that was that was probably an error. Uh, if I if I sent an email, I would see you on Wednesday. Then that was meant for the other class, since uh, the other class is Monday, Wednesday. Um, for three B, let me double check. I uh, I don't think there are any other any extra reading checks for three B. Um, or for three. Yep. No, there are no other reading checks for for chapter three. So it's just three uh, A and three C. Um, there's actually only one more reading check that we will not be lecturing on, and that's in chapter four. Um, but after that, all of the reading checks and homework will be the same. There won't be any extra extra uh, sections to read. But let's go through this real quick. Um, I think we already, I think we, I already covered this really quickly, um, but I did want to go over it. Uh, so this this group this uh, project is a group project, which means you'll be working as a group um, towards coming up with this paper. Be one submission per group, and there are two parts to the paper. First part is you're identifying logical fallacies in in a, a media source. It can be any media source. It can be TV. It can be the internet. It can be um, a magazine or a newspaper. Uh, it can even be uh, social media, but uh, for social media, you can only use one uh, source from social media. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to find that argument, going to um, first cite the source. And so let's, let's um, uh, use either, well, I, I don't really care if you use APA or MLA. Um, for citing the reference, just as long as you're consistent throughout the paper. Um, but so, what is the source? Who is, who is the author? Where did you find it? If it's a if it's a an online article, what is the URL? Then, after the source information, you're going to write what is the premise or premises. Here's premise one. Here's premise two. Here's premise three. However many premises you have, uh, and then here is the conclusion. And it doesn't have to be a long argument. You can even you can find one that's just um, a, just a portion of an article, just one one type. Uh, that's even say three sentences. Sentence one is a premise. Sentence two is a premise. Sentence three is a conclusion. Um, and then uh, after that, after you summarize that premise, 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 conclusion, then you're going to have a small paragraph or two explaining this is the fallacy that occurred. This is how that fallacy works. This is how it was applied in this argument. I think I see a, a question here. Um, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, there was a question if, um, in terms of a logical fallacy, is it a two-sided argument, uh, two-sided issue or argument? Um, it would be two-sided uh, if you are doing the straw man fallacy. The other ones, it just has to be a single argument. Like someone says, take for example, you find an article that says vanilla ice cream is the best ice cream ever. Here's why. And you find a fallacy in that, then that's that would be the the thing. Um, so just a single single statement, one side of an issue. Uh, two sided would be if you if you uh, are doing the uh, sorry the straw man, not false false straw man. Um, no, you you don't have to do all ten fallacies. So you're just doing this for two arguments. Um, so the source. Uh, the structure of the argument, so premise, 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 conclusion, and then a paragraph or two, a short paragraph or two, full sentences, because this is just like if you were, you know, arguing with your friend um, about what this is the fallacy that occurred, this is how it was applied, this is how that fallacy works. And then you'll do that for two arguments. So part one, you're finding two arguments, two different arguments, um, can be from the same uh, newspaper or from the same TV uh, news network thing, whatever you want, just as long as there, there are two of them. It doesn't have to be, though. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, so it can be any logical fallacy. You basically just have to find it. Um, I, would I would prefer if it's one of, one of the 10 that we talked about in class. Uh, <laughs> that, would, that would make life easier for everybody, but um, yeah. So that's part one. Part two. Uh, what you're doing for part two is you're finding one more argument. So in part one, you found two arguments. Part two, you're finding one more argument. 
And this argument, you're going to, again, you're going to have the source, you're going to state, uh, this is the, the premise, 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 conclusion, however many premises you have, even if you just have one premise, that's fine. Um, and for, uh, for this one, you're going to uh, analyze the argument more in depth. You're going to say, um, here is a Venn diagram representing the argument. So it, it will be a deductive argument, hopefully. Um, just like what we had in, in uh, analyzing, you know, drawing the Venn diagram, you're going to state, is this argument valid? Is it sound? And then uh, just a, a short paragraph explaining. Uh, so you'll include the Venn, you know, the Venn diagram and then a short paragraph explaining um, whether it is valid or not and why, whether it is sound or not and why. And that's part two. So overall for this, for this project, three arguments per group, two for part one where you're finding a fallacy, one for part two where you are analyzing the argument more in detail. And so again, those three separate arguments, they can't be the same. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the project. That's the whole of the project. Um, another thing I did uh, add here on the left-hand side, there is a people tab. If you click on that and then click on groups, uh, these are the groups that were randomly generated um, on web campus. Uh, so these are the groups that were decided besides those that wanted to be in their, uh, in their own solo group. Those are here at the bottom. Uh, the rest were randomly generated by web campus. Um, so those are the groups. And uh, let's go ahead and split into those now. Um, so this is how you can find the people. Uh, so if you're in group one, those are the names of the people in group one. Um, so then you can easily uh contact your group let me let me stop the share here and actually let me stop the recording because the rest of this is not uh lecture <laughs>